And so, and so that's, I think, an important context to note, because I think when people hear, some of the people in the West are going to hear some of what you just said and cringe. Uh, yeah. <laughs> because because they're, they're thinking from their context that's very different. Right. Um, and so I think I think, but I think you've communicated very clearly. Um, yeah. Is that we set it up and and that the commitment is there for a reason and for the liberation. Uh, it's not it, it. That's what's really first is yeah. the liberatory educative process. Yes. Um, not merely getting some diploma. It's not. It's it, that's that's trivial. Yeah. Some people might think, oh, they want to keep it for a long period of time to give certain kind of, you know, to uh, what do you say? Some may even think that uh, we are trying to brainwash, brainwash them <laughs> by keeping them for a long. Here, you see, there are no boundaries. Right. There are no boundaries. You've been here. You've seen here. Children are, you know, Children are uh, communicating with people from different parts of the world. Okay. They are playing with them. They are learning different languages. Mm -hmm. They are experimenting on entrepreneurship. They are going out to the market selling things for the community. Mm -hmm. And they are just having interaction, you know, left, right uh, uh, and center, you know, right. with everybody. Right. So the, the, there is no one idea that we are perpetuating. The idea, of course, there is this great the the, the 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 overall encompassing philosophy of mother and Sri Aurobindo, right. but there is no one religion that we follow there is no one particular uh, uh, you know uh, theory that we follow right. uh, we believe that everybody has that innate possibility innate uh, nature and one has to discover that that's right. the only right. thing <laughs> and whatever aids into that process we tell you, we provide it we right. try to bring it right so we have volunteers from different parts of the world with different ideas, different ideologies, different religion, different race, different languages, and they are constantly communicating with our students. So there is no way that we are trying to, you know, <laughs> brainwash them and create right. some kind of... <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. But I, I wanted to bring that up because, because I mean, from the psychological perspective, um, the, the democratic nature is actually the exact counter of what you would consider uh, what psychologists call a total situation. So there's the fear of immersing in a long term and things like that. Mm -hmm. But but what you've described from the very beginning and what I've seen here is that it is open. It yeah. is an open system. It is uh, that the children are uh, freely interacting. Uh, you know, they really are. It is an immersion. But it's a voluntary immersion. Right. It is that you've created such a welcoming place where those children feel that they belong. Mm -hmm. Is that they develop an identity, and it, it's informed yeah. by the ashram. Yeah. But it is not determined. It is not controlled. It is not the, the, those things that would be define the exact opposite. That the brainwashing type thing, that the cult thing. Mm -hmm. um, is about control and overwhelming them and, and uh, you know, sleep deprivation and, you know, those all those other things. That does not have any. <laughs> <laughs> sure. so. Our children are as free as anybody in the world, sure. you know. This is the Agentic Schools podcast, where you will learn about schools from around the world where children's agency to make decisions about their learning and living more important than their academic skills. I'm your host, Don Berg. Hello and welcome to the Agentic Schools podcast. I'm here with someone I know as Veda, um, but I'm sure you have a much more, name, more of a name than that. So uh, I'm going to have you go ahead and, and we're at the um, Shri Aurobindo Yoga Mandir uh, Ashram. And, and within that, you are the principal of the school here. Mm -hmm. So uh, just give us a little, uh, our audience, a little introduction. Say your proper name <laughs> and tell us about the school. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Namaste. So this is Veda. Uh, my full name is Vedananda Pandey. Or my students, they call me Veda Dai. What, what this means is Dai means brother. So all my students, they call me uh, Veda brother. And I uh, have been working as the principal of the school for the past about nine years now. Mm -hmm. uh, as soon as I finished my studies, uh, I think it was like 
at the age of 24. Since then, I've been working as the principal of the school. And uh, yeah, I've been interested in education for many, many years. And I grew up in the ashram itself. And when I was four years old, I came to the ashram and ashram was in its beginning phase. And uh, my uncle, who is the founder of the organization, he brought me to the organization. And, uh, and I've grown in the ashram. Yeah. And I'm, I've grown in the philosophy of the school, philosophy of the ashram, and f which is uh, the philosophy of integral education. Right on, right on. So um, to kick off sort of getting a little deeper, let's tell me a story about um, a particular student, uh, in this case it might even be you, uh, a particular student who really got great value from the school, really uh, took it to heart, um, and, and, and you know, kind of blossomed through what the school has to offer. Um, there are a lot of stories, but I think it's easier for me to talk about my own story in some ways. Um, and of course, we can get into these stories of the other. It's easier for me to know, I mean, <laughs> I know a bit more about myself. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, I grew up in the ashram environment. And initially, the ashram was not a school, it didn't have a school as such. So we had very you know, open kind of schooling where we studied different languages, we studied a little bit of mathematics, science, but most of the times we were playing in nature, you know, helping uh, uh, the ashram grow and uh, helping each other. And from the beginning itself, the idea was uh, that human life has infinite possibilities. Mm. This is the idea with which we grew. And this is what we tried to explore uh, from the beginning itself. So if you want to check your limit, you always have to push it, mm -hmm. right, in some ways, consciously. So that conscious pushing has always driven me to explore my own possibilities. Mm -hmm. And uh, Sri Aurobindo's philosophy is based on the philosophy of integral education. What Sri Aurobindo says is that human being is not only the physical body, it's not only the vital body, part of, uh, it doesn't only have vital dimension, mm -hmm. vital means the energy, the desires, all that, you know, emotions and so on. And not only the mental aspect, but it has the other dimensions which is yet to explore and is, uh, now we are at the right time where we need to explore the psychic and spiritual dimension. Mm -hmm. So for that, uh, I think Ashram has given me that environment where, uh, you know, uh, one is directly or indirectly made to explore that unseen dimension of mm -hmm. human human life mm -hmm. through different uh, uh, you know uh, different activities, different in, uh, you know inclination or different way of ways of thinking about life. Mm -hmm. So um, from right from young age, I have. Uh, uh, always engaged in taking responsibilities, mm -hmm. becoming a conscious human being, becoming conscious of our own emotions, mm -hmm. our own desires, and carefully channelizing our life in a direction, mm -hmm. a, a direction that is filled with intentions, right? Mm -hmm. We live a life which is, uh, yes, we, we act very spontaneously, but at the same time that spontaneity is not real spontaneity. It is born out of desires, mm -hmm. born out of the pressure of the society. We feel that it's spontaneous, but to be able to listen to oneself, one has to clear out all the coverings that we have gathered mm -hmm. throughout our life, right? From our past life, we believe in past life as well, right. and also the present life. And uh, so in that sense, from the beginning, from young age itself, taking responsibilities, uh, developing that uh, true nature of human life, to be able to love somebody, despite differences, mm -hmm. despite, despite disagreements, all that has really led me to really, you know, accept everybody even though they are different. Mm -hmm. And after finishing my eighth grade here, I mean, uh, I, I was admitted to a nearby school. We, we, we used to walk uh, down the paddy fields. Uh -huh. Now it's not anymore there. <laughs> it's covered with the concrete buildings. Uh, we attended a very simple school because ashram was not, you know, financially in a sound state. Mm -hmm. And then after that, I got the opportunity to study uh, uh, further my school education in the town, mm -hmm. uh, which was also kind of uh, 
you know, they provided us free education there. And then after that, I got a scholarship to study in India. I spent about uh, three, four years studying mathematics and science, uh, physics in India in one of the best institutions nice. on scholarship given by Indian government. And then from there, I got to travel to Germany to further my studies. And after that, I decided to return immediately rather than get into job life and so mm-hmm. on because I was, uh, that, that drive to serve, that drive to take care of others mm-hmm. and the ashram was there in me and I felt that ashram needed someone to take care of the education, someone to take care of the future generation because uh, the school uh, that uh, my uncle had started, it really needed uh, that kind of push. So I, I, I enjoyed returning back and I started dedicating my life. Right and I'm happy. Yeah. <laughs> That's important. <laughs> um, so, so one of the things that, that is really, um, you know, we've been, we've been, you hosted our IDEC, thank you very much. <laughs> and, and, and one of the, the key phrases that's on, on all the big posters and things is uh, Surya Obindo said, um, you know, true, uh, true, uh, a true teaching. Yeah, yeah. The first principle of true teaching is that nothing can be taught. That's right, that's right. And, and so hosting an IDEC seems really, that, that seemed like an, a, a, an ideal saying. You know, I was like, wow, you guys really nailed it. Um, <laughs> so tell me about the, the, how the ashram school um, had kind of, how does it handle the democratic aspect? Like it, 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 you've hosted it, you're, you're, you're part of it, and yet right. you have your, your teachings, your foundational teachings are about sort of the, the, the humility that a teacher must have mm-hmm. uh, in approaching a student. So, so tell me about how, uh, how that fits with Nepali, you know, uh, schooling, you know, mm-hmm. as a compare. Um, and so tell me about kind of how the democratic process works here. Well, uh, I think uh, our approach to democratic learning, uh, it focuses on the, uh, on the freedom that lies within each of us. Mm-hmm. And that is very, very important, right? You may develop a system that supports democratic learning, mm-hmm. but actually the teacher has to develop that attitude from within. He has to truly believe that the seeking of freedom is the ultimate and you cannot find freedom because you develop a system. Of course, systems are important, but at the same time, you see, as a teacher, uh, I teach many subjects. Uh, I love teaching. I spend a lot of time with the students. And what I've felt is that when a teacher assumes a position and, and starts to think that, okay, he is someone who is imparting knowledge, that's where the problem lies. Right, right. The thing is, it's not about you teaching. Mm-hmm. It's about you growing. Mm-hmm. It's absolutely, you know, that's the fundamental idea where the teaching Sri Aurobindo's philosophy rests on. Yeah. You are not serving someone, you are serving yourself. Mm-hmm. You are not putting out knowledge to somebody. You are expanding your consciousness. Mm-hmm. And everything that we do in life, whether it's teaching, whether it's working with the children, whether it's, uh, you know, uh, having a laugh with the children, whether it's walking, whether it's uh, mowing a lawn or whether it's picking some rubbish or uh, lying on the streets and so on. Every action must be directed towards expansion of your consciousness. Mm-hmm. And if that attitude is developed in each and every child or, or each and every especially teachers, <laughs> not child, what really happens is the teacher seeks freedom. Mm-hmm. And teachers thought process from, uh, from being someone who is uh, putting out knowledge, from that perspective, it changes to looking within oneself. What happens when a teacher is encountering a child or is with a child learning or teaching, let's say teaching in that inverted comma sense, uh, teacher has to observe himself. Mm -hmm. This is the process. How how are emotions being developed in the teacher? How is teacher taking the whole process of, you know, process of sharing that knowledge? Mm -hmm. If there is a problem with the student, is it, the problem is not with the student. Absolutely not. The problem is within oneself. Mm -hmm. The 
the way a student reflects, the way the, the kind of uh, attitude that student reflects is your own attitude being reflected on a child. Mm. That is what we should learn. And that's the reason why Sri Aurobindo says that you cannot, in fact, teach anything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. You cannot teach. You can probably just be, you can be there right. at the most. You can be there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And teaching is like, an excuse for one, for teachers actually to be uh, to be very frank is an excuse for teachers to grow themselves. Mm -hmm. yeah. So this Sri Aurobindo directly uh, Sri Aurobindo's philosophy is really involved with expansion of consciousness. Yeah. If any system that inhibits the development of consciousness, the system is not worth enough. Mm -hmm. It's not good enough. Right. And you see, uh, we, we may develop certain systems that aid democratic learning, but over time what happens is it becomes a, a boundary. It becomes a, a, a cage in itself. Mm -hmm. So therefore that also has, has to be broken. Mm -hmm. So to find true freedom, of course, we have to develop democratic learning processes, but these democratic learning processes also should continuously change. Right. And it should change. How do we know that it should change? It should, one knows if the system is truly supporting the development of consciousness, one can truly experience it. Mm -hmm. If it is helping in the development, yes, that's the way. If it is inhibiting or not helping, right. then probably there is another way. Mm -hmm. So that's what we constantly look forward mm -hmm. in our teaching processes, right. whether it's the collective consciousness, the individual consciousness is expanding, is becoming wider and wider, or it's becoming shallow and narrower or narrower. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's where the democratic learning comes into our right. schooling. So, so um, one of the themes in my podcast has been that, that very type of flexibility, is that there are ways that the, you know, the sc schools may start in one place, and you know, it might be sociocracy or, or holacracy or uh, some, you know, majority voting, whatever the thing is, and then they develop from there. Um, so what are some of the ways that that decisions are made or that now, actually, let me clarify something first. Uh, um, the school is, has students in residence, so it's a boarding school. Boarding school, right. Do you have both boarding and day students? No, only boarding only students. Boarding students. Okay. Only for those who are residents of this school. Okay, okay. So, so that, that's an important thing to know, um, yeah. especially with the question I'm about to ask. Was, um, so, so there's a certain um, school, the Nepali government says there's a certain things that have to happen in a school. Yes? Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, then, and then the, the beyond that, then the students are in the community, they're in the ashram. Mm -hmm. And so uh, how are decisions, is that a democratic process of making decisions about how, what goes on in the ashram, or is that how, it, it, does the democ democracy extend to their life outside of school? Um, yeah, so uh, taking, to take your first uh, uh, concern about, uh, first thing about, uh, you know, having school, having students in the, in the campus itself. Mm -hmm. So we believe that learning is a 24 hour process, you see. Yeah. And if you want to develop a certain environment, it's extremely important in the context of Nepal. I'm not sure about the outside world, but in the context of Nepal, what happens is, you know, th there are certain, the, the ashram wants to develop certain atmosphere around children, where they feel that growing is a 24 seven process. It doesn't happen only in the school. So therefore, our particular concern is that we only take students, those who are going to be here 24-7, mm -hmm. so that they completely immerse in life, in the lifestyle of the ashram. Right. Right. And of course, others are also invited to come and visit. Their parents are invited to come and visit. They can come and stay with us. They can serve the ashram and so on. But students should be and must be together. And it is a family-like environment that we want to create. Mm -hmm. It's not like there are hierarchies and so on and so forth. It's not like school in conventional sense, right, right. where there are teachers, professors, you should listen to them. It's like a family that, 
in a family you have different responsibility like father has a different responsibility mother has a different responsibility. children have a different res responsibility so um probably children are not going to take parents responsibility right because in that sense that kind of equality and that kind of democratic processes are ingrained in the whole system right so like i said they call me vedai and uh, the founder uh, they call him mama mama means uncle mm. so it's like living together 24/7 mm -hmm. even if you look into their uh, you know uh, accommodation the kind of accommodation they are all there's a mixed group mm -hmm. a child is living with other few students who are of different age group so they will act like guardians yeah, yeah. while they are uh, in the room mm -hmm. you see mm -hmm. so this this is extremely important for us and the other part that uh, you were talking the, the 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 decision making how does the decision making happen so there is of course there is one part which we do not want to change mm -hmm. which is the principles of learning or principles of the school which is laid down by shri arbindo and the mother mm -hmm. based on the integral yoga why are we here we don't want to change that right no matter what happens we don't want to change we are here to expand our consciousness we are here to build a community which fundamentally believes in the development and the infinite potential of each and every individual yeah. and if we strongly feel that it is any any system is contrary to that ideology and philosophy we don't want to change yeah. and anything that aids is of course welcome and regarding other you know decision making for example in the school what happens is generally in the morning there is always an assembly at 10 o'clock mm -hmm. so it's a student led assembly uh -huh. so teachers are just lying around outside you know and they are just helping they are just aids but uh, the senior students with the younger ones they actually organize how the day is going to look like uh -huh. so if for example some students in the context of our ashram some students those who are new they do not know how to about a lot of things about hygiene they they do not know how to wear clothes they uh, they don't know how to behave mm -hmm. and all these problems arise right. so in this assembly what happens is these senior students they formulate a way to go forward mm -hmm. for example there are leaders they select leaders and these leaders check keep a regular check uh, they check regularly these check in the sense that they take care of these students the children right, right, right. and uh, so this assembly is like one of the uh, most important part of uh, right. the decision making mm -hmm. and on fridays especially if there are if there are problems that have occurred throughout the week mm -hmm. what happens is we sit together we discuss about it how why when how, you know mm -hmm. all those things can be discussed there and um, if students themselves come up with a solution it's implemented without having to consult with the teachers it yeah. goes along but there are certain aspects that uh, we need to also be part mm -hmm. and uh, and the other the ashram life also has this democratic mm -hmm. processes where in the evening we are all we all gather together in the meditation hall for meditation ah, yeah. so during the meditation hall everybody has the right to say what they want to say if there is an issue if there is a problem if they want to do something and then if people agree with it we go ahead with that mm -hmm. so uh, you see the thing is uh, the democratic process in the ashram is is not like a written uh, uh, document or a written way or a, a very well crafted way it's a very spontaneous way where there are you know where there is no hierarchy and everybody it's a fluid kind of hierarchy mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. every child has someone with whom they feel comfortable right. and that they share with that individual and that person approaches somebody else and there is no certain path to reach you yeah. know to make the information reach to a particular place mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so anybody can come to me anybody can go to somebody else any company can go to the founder it's right. all the doors are always open mm -hmm. and we can go to a somebody it's uh, it's like that so right. Right. so so the the adults have been in the ashram has long been around longer than the school 
And so the adults basically developed a community process, a way of living together, holding the ideals and the ideology. And then the school came along. <laughs> right. um, and no, so actually it happened simultaneously, more or less simultaneously. Okay. Okay. Because in the beginning we didn't have adults. Oh, really? I mean, the only founder was the adult, and along with them we, we were children. Oh, I see. I didn't know that. And that's how he passed, right? Uh, in some ways he translated those ideals into the system. Okay, okay. And so, we, we grew up in those in that system and uh, abiding by those uh, ideals. Right, right. So the point still holds. The, the point I was making is just that through the founding process, the, the, the ideals were held and, and, and a system developed. Right. It may not be written down, yeah. but, but there's, a, there's a sense, there's a yogic tradition behind this. There is, you know, there, there's a cultural tradition behind right. this. And so these children are not showing up and, you know, not knowing what to do entirely. Mm -hmm. They may not know hygiene. They may not know how to behave in this one or, you know, but there are expectations and there is a cultural support for those things. This right. is one of the things I find is that um, the, the schools that have been successful for, for any length of time find some culturally embedded way of doing their school. Mm -hmm. At Summerhill, it was you know one thing. At Sudbury, it was another, and here it's a it's a different one. Right, right. So, but but you found a way to to express Nepali culture, to hold sacred the the values that your founder brought. Right. Um, and now you you've simply grown in that mm -hmm. and have come back to uh, continue right. the work. Yeah, that's great. I love that. <laughs> that's very very important. Also, you see, because what happens is. A uh, human being comes with certain knowledge. This is the ancient uh, philosophy or experiences that uh, we have learned, we've come to know that the sages and the saints of the past, they have said that human being is not an empty slate. Right. One may believe that it's, a child is an empty slate, but child also brings certain uh, knowledge or imprints or impressions from the past life mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and if we do not rely on the good imprints that each individual brings from mm -hmm. the past life you cannot possibly create a strong foundation on which the child grows exactly yeah. you see in the sense identity you see we talk about yeah. identity yeah. and identity is important mm -hmm. right to feel that you belong to something to to, to have that to have that innate nature nourished yes. is very very important like rose rose is a rose right yeah. you cannot say oh I want to grow lotus out of rose mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that's why you know in the school we are completely embedded in in, in Nepali culture yeah. and Nepali tradition mm -hmm. the spiritual aspect of Nepal but at the same time, we have something new in the sense that we do not want to stick to the superstitions, mm -hmm. to the rituals right. that, that binds human being to accept something new that is coming. Mm -hmm. You see, Sri Aurobindo always says that if you want to get something new, you have to empty yourself. Mm -hmm. You have to find, you have to make some part which is where you can actually, you know, something, if it's not, if, if the bowl is completely filled, yeah. no new thing can come. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So hold on to the best of what you have mm -hmm. from, the, uh, uh, from the past, mm -hmm. but also keep some part that is empty to hold on to some new consciousness that is going to dawn, dawn upon you. Right. Right. So that's why we have yoga, meditation, you know, uh, we have karma yoga, we call it as karma yoga, that is service, service to the divine. Mm -hmm. The concept is to serve, not to make something better, mm -hmm. not to, not because your ego is going to be satisfied because you help somebody, yeah. but to clean yourself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To see in each and everything that there is supreme consciousness residing. Mm -hmm. The inner 
truth that is that holds everything together right. to understand that you have to continuously engage yourself in service mm -hmm. without any expectation that's very very important right. <laughs> so this this is like the crux of uh, of the philosophy of the cultural aspect that uh, that ashram imbibes mm -hmm. or ashram mm -hmm. it goes forward yeah yeah um so so i i i can uh say that that at least in science of psychology we have also realized that no child is a blank slate that was a bad idea <laughs> 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 um and so and so the, it's an interesting confluence is that once again science is validating its ancient wisdom um in its way um uh, so that's I, I like that. Um, yeah. So, so, and and to add on to that, what I would like to say is, yes, no child is a blank slate, but it doesn't mean that it, the child has to be clutched with the past impressions. Yeah. Also, that's also very important. Yeah. And Sri Aurobindo says that it is the dawn of the consciousness. If if we work within ourselves, what happens is the new consciousness, or the expansion of consciousness, can clean away all the you know. The impressions, the, the 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 horrible impressions in some ways right. that we've carried. Mm -hmm. So we we are in some ways free in that sense. We yeah. are free in that sense. Right. But the work must be done. Right. 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 So um, yeah. So so the the you can see it in in sort of the idea of generational trauma is a, a way of thinking about right. that, and then saying you know the the. The way the brain works is it, it, it holds that to some degree, mm -hmm. but we can also heal from that. Right, um, exactly. So, so the flexibility of the brain, it never ends. Um, and so there's always the possibility, the potentiality mm -hmm. to, to move beyond whatever that trauma was. Right. Uh, whether it was this lifetime or oppressed. Right. Um, uh, so yeah, yeah. Um, and, and, and mostly, I think it's important that we understand that it's not about suppression of, of the trauma. It's about, uh, how do I say, it's about, uh, you know, it's like when there's darkness, if you bring a light, a candle, mm -hmm. darkness just evades away. Right. Right. And, and, and I, th I think one way of saying it is that rather than suppressing a trauma, what you're doing is developing a new relationship to it. Right. It's like you, you don't deny the past. What you do is you acknowledge the past. Mm -hmm. And, and the personal work is, what is my relation to that? Right. The personal work is, oh, am I, you know, angry about that? Am I holding anger? Am I expressing anger? Right. Or any other, it, it could be any of the emotions. Um, but then what, do, what relationship do I need to have with that in order to be nurturing and nurtured and, and, and be uh, a fully, you know, to, to be more, fully connected to, because because the, the problem with trauma is just that it takes you out of the present, that it takes right. it, it, it destroys your relationship to the present. Mm -hmm. And so the new relationship to the past needs to be, how can I acknowledge it and then be present to whatever is true now, not have my consciousness defined by the trauma. All right, right, right. My consciousness needs to be defined by what is present yeah. here and now. Yeah. And a greater consciousness would be about uh, not just here and now in our physical being, but here and now thinking more broadly. Like you, you could put it in ecological terms and say, well, what does what does what does my relationship to the earth mean? What does my relationship to society mean? What right. does my relationship to myself mean? To even turn it, flip it around and go internal. What do I need to be to care for my myself? Mm -hmm. um, but it can go either way, right. and then the, the the consciousness is not just the the chatter in the mind. Right. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. it's both something deeper inside, but also much more expanded outside. Right. That's 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 precisely. Uh, I, I I mean I get it. Yeah. yeah. That's that's like what Sri Aurobindo also tries to uh, talk about. How you know the 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 point is that that we get stuck with the trauma of the past because somehow we identify ourselves and we confine ourselves and define ourselves through those lenses, right. Right? right? But if you can expand and you, if you can build greater relationships with greater or with, with, with the world around you, what happens is 
that becomes a very very insignificant part or let's right. say um, th that really you know uh, uh, or, I mean it just vanishes in some ways <laughs> right so it's it's like you become a, 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 a your your individuality becomes more and more universal universal right, right. right. so so <clears throat> So one of the things that, that I like to talk about when, about schools is not just the school itself, but its relation to the greater context. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm curious because uh, what is your relationship to the Nepali government in terms of in terms of curriculum and things like that? Are they do they inspect the school? Do they like how closely do they met? Like are you beholden to them in terms of your curriculum or things like that? Is there so yes, I mean Nepali government at the moment doesn't want us to, you know, have our own curriculums, mm -hmm. have our own way of doing things. Mm -hmm. They have uh, they define even the dates for the exams, mm -hmm. and suggest us many many things in that sense. And of course, uh, every child must appear for national exams. So, and we have to provide detailed documentation about the child in what year he is, what subject he is taking, and uh, whether he has passed the exam, he or she, and all that we have to provide as a data. Yeah. And uh, regarding, of course, out of the school we have certain amount of freedom, we can teach them or we can, uh, we can create an environment where child grows in a different way, mm -hmm. but at the same time we have to make sure that it fulfills the demand of the government. Right. So that's why for example, in class ten, we have to uh, we have to have eight subjects, right. and all the compulsory subjects like mathematics, science, English, all of these subjects must be taught, mm -hmm. and the students must pass if they want to go further in their yeah, you know further in their schooling or university or, a, or right. for job and so on, and uh, there is a regular inspection about how the child is doing and uh, what kind of uh, whether we have, uh, whether we are following the, the, the methodology that the government has uh, defined, right. and uh, we have to regularly attend their meetings and so on. Yeah. But we try to, you know, give them a bit of a challenge as well by, by uh, saying that there is an alternative. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not uh, the government way is the highway or uh, is not the only way. Yeah. Uh, but then. Uh, it's pretty hard at the moment because we do not have many, you know, alternative schools. So we tried initially what happened a few years back, what we did was we wanted to include some other curriculum. Uh, we wanted to mix up a few things because they have these different school types that the government has defined. One is the, one is like this uh, Guru Kula, which, which is a uh, little bit more about uh, you know, Sanskrit and uh, the ancient, uh, you know, uh, schooling method. Mm -hmm. And the other one is modern one, which includes science, mathematics, and so on. Mm -hmm. We wanted to have mixture of both. Mm -hmm. And that's why we wanted to, uh, 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 we wanted to make sure that we design a new curriculum where students, those who want to learn ancient languages also should have the opportunity to learn mathematics and science and computers and so on. Mm -hmm. So we look for that, uh, you know, that possibility, but uh, somehow we, uh, we, we, we fail there, in, you know, uh, but I think in future we have been proposing that, uh, mm -hmm. yes, those who are in conventional school also, they should be able to learn Sanskrit, uh, the ancient language, because that also has certain, you know, uh, values of the culture and that may give that uh, foundation to a child to grow and prosper. Mm -hmm. But then uh, it's pretty hard uh, to find an alternate. Like in the IDEC also, we, we had a, a politician here. Right, right. Uh, I mean, one of the politicians, uh, he was uh, very much into, okay, we need world class, world class. It was all about world class, you see. Uh, what about Nepal class? What about mm -hmm. our culture class, right? And uh, this mindset is a bit of a challenge at the moment. Yeah. So... Yeah, I mean, th this is just one example of the same challenge occurs everywhere. Everywhere, right. uh, But some places it's just more challenging than others. Like, I mean, your your context is particularly challenging, challenging mainly because you seem to be the only alternative. 
you know, the only, you know, democratic, you know, there's, you don't have, uh, I mean, I, I actually, it's interesting because I've seen as we're driving through town and we're doing our touristing thing and, and I'll see vans that say, you know, Montessori and, <laughs> but they seem to be, you know, primary level or, or medium yeah. prefix. So, so it's, that's like in the U S there's very little higher level, you know, higher levels of Montessori. Um, they exist, but they're just few and far between. Initially, actually, the school was not registered. Huh? But then we couldn't have children without registration. Right. We had to register. Right. We didn't want to have exams. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And government was always asking about report cards. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what to do? Yeah. Yeah. And then we slowly started exams. And then government provided us with a document mm -hmm. that first terminal examination, we have to submit how much marks they have gotten. Second terminal examination, third terminal examination. Yeah. 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 And I mean, what to do? You see. Uh, right, right. Is it to exist or to be compliant? And yeah, I mean, either we should give up because, uh, or we should keep on continuing uh, our work uh, and somehow, you know, continuously work so that in future, hopefully, they will, because of us, Mm -hmm. Because and somebody believes in us, and they also start another school which is right. which believes in that, and slowly that movement can change. You see, yeah. and that's what we believe. You know, we have to keep up with the work. Right. We may at the moment we may uh, have to fall in line with a certain aspect, but slowly as we work uh, more and more, and uh, we show the example of through our students and what right. they are capable of, I think government will slowly also start to believe that there is an another way to education right right yeah yeah and i think that you know that's a bit of what my work is focused on is is how do we bridge those gaps between kind of the alternative world and and the mainstream and say okay what is a language that perhaps could translate over and you know how can we pull lessons from something that looks so different uh, but still have a common language because the human beings are common to both uh, right. the psychology <laughs> well, look at this. So we invited a lot of educators actually to mm -hmm. come and be part of IDEC. Right. right. Uh, educators and also the government officials. Right. From Convention. So not many were interested. That's right. So, so the bureaucra the... bureaucracy, from bureaucracy, we had hardly any people. That's right. That's right. Because uh, it was like, what is this? You know? Right. <laughs> yeah. But fortunately, we had the minister who came and who supported right. the event. Yeah. And that yeah. was uh, something that was uh, fantastic. Yeah, when, when, so Joyce was a professor at Portland State University uh, for 32 years, I think. Um, and so over the last 10 years, we would have events at PSU, at the, at the university, and we would go to the education department and say, hey, we're having this event, and you know, show the Summer Hill movie, we showed several different films about alternatives, and, and it was rare. The only time, I think the first and only time we got the, someone from the education department to come was when we invited them to be on a panel to discuss uh, yeah. the event. But yeah. they didn't just show up spontaneously. <laughs> yeah, so it was the same thing. You have to call them for a keynote or they have to right, call right. them for a panel. Just, you know, otherwise, it's a bit of a challenge. Yeah, yeah. And so, I, I, I had hoped actually those are some of the police. Um, one of them was, was very kind enough to listen to us, but some were not very uh, interested. They were there to deliver a lecture and then they went off. Right. <laughs> So, so we, we we feel your pain. <laughs> okay. So, so one of the things I like to ask is is about any school that has developed and and, and you know this one's been around for a while. Oh, wow. um, and so one of the things that happens is that there are unique things that uh, uh, either f like a jargon or or code words or or just something that that's unique to this place. But the, uh, share one, or if you have it, um, that, that would then be of benefit to the to others if they if they knew about it. Um, jargon in the sense, can you can you elaborate? Uh, so so for instance, um, one of the schools I was interviewing, they had this thing. Uh, I forget what they called this, um, but it was a way to have have everyone focus in one place. So they would do this, or um, or at uh, Village Free School, um, they had the uh, stop seriously. You know how children will play and it gets too rough and so one has to be able to tell the you know they may say stop but then everybody thinks you're playing mm -hmm. and so they came up with a code word which stops seriously so that means no you really have to stop now <laughs> oh, okay. uh, so so but that was one that, that uh, other other schools have variations on that theme 
Do you have anything? Um, I think uh, off the top of my head, uh, generally, it's like, uh, I mean, in Nepali, whenever there is, I need to gather students, I say, uh, uh, it's like, uh, there is one, like, something that, like, Ilaj Garni. It's in Nepali. It means don't be too mischievous <laughs> ah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to get attention. Uh -huh. for, for example, a child, if, uh, if we have a big group and uh, they're doing something and the teacher wants their attention, then Ilaj Garni. Ilaj Garni uh, mean, it means, Ilaj means medication. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Now we have to medicate ourselves in some ways, you see. <laughs> that is a good one. <laughs> now it plays differently in the West, but... <laughs> yeah, it, it's not medication in the uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. medicine sense, you see. Yeah, it's yeah. like, uh, let's be together. Right. Yeah. Then let's be together. Please, hear me out. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's, it, translating phrases is, is can be tricky. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, cool, cool. Um, okay, so... so let me think about this a minute. Um, so, so one of the other kind of aspects I'd like to get at is conflict resolution. Mm -hmm. So um, now you've described some of it, and it sounds very informal for the most part, um, that once a conflict comes up between two kids, then, then you know, there's going to be some support just from their uh, group uh, informally. Right. Do they have, like, if, if things... They're, if, it, if they're not happy with it, can is there more formal aspects to the, how you resolve conflicts? So generally what happens is with the conflict, uh, let's say uh, two students have a conflict, generally what happens is some time is given. Mm -hmm. You see, conflicts uh, is natural to human being right. and uh, some conflicts just need time. Yeah, okay. That's it, and uh, it gets resolved. Mm -hmm. But then if the conflict persists and if it requires serious attention what happens is depending on the nature for example uh, generally two students are made to talk with one another mm -hmm. a typical incident would be for example if somebody hits a child it hits the other one mm -hmm. now the thing is you see whoever is involved it's better if they themselves can resolve rather than the whole system falling on it yeah. right and that's our fundamental principle. If things can be resolved it, by two or three, whoever is involved, mm -hmm. that's the way. So generally what happens is the two, they come and just sit apart mm -hmm. and talk about it mm -hmm. and be there. Just by being there, uh, it's, I mean, most of the times it's resolved. Right. If you let them they be there for half an hour or one hour, mm -hmm. the conflict is resolved because, you know, Ultimately, what happens is over time, if you give one hour, approximately one hour to our students, they start to realize that it was a petty thing that okay. they were, you know, uh, having trouble with. Yeah. And then, okay, fine, leave it. Mm -hmm. But then there are uh, problems which require serious attentions. Mm -hmm. So the first is, of course, like I said, students, they try to find the resolution right. themselves right. Right. or they try to resolve it themselves. The second one is interference of the of the of the teachers. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to interference with the teachers, the teachers they generally uh, we have three four teachers coming together, mm -hmm. or at least three teachers, mm -hmm. and the first part is to listen to everybody, right. listen to each sides, and uh, and independently. Mm -hmm. Without the uh, each party has a certain amount of time, they talk about it mm -hmm. to teachers and the one who has witnessed it. Mm -hmm. So the witness is also there, and also the other part also comes. And the first proposition is, how do you want us to resolve? Mm -hmm. The responsibility goes to the students, right. Right. and how much if the issue is not resolved, how much time do you need? Uh, yeah. That's interesting. Can we get back to it tomorrow? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? 
and uh, generally most of the problems are resolved through this if you give time and that support you know generally all the problems are resolved but of course there are problems which can persist even longer mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and sometimes there are strict actions also that we need to take for example if it goes beyond the philosophy of the organization itself mm -hmm. very rarely yeah. i think we had in the past 30 years we had to take if it is contrary to the philosophy itself harming the whole community then uh, the student is actually sent out of the community right uh, this is like the extreme mm -hmm. yeah, yeah extreme one yeah. so th th you see the circle gets bigger and bigger in some ways right in conflict resolution the first is the ones who are involved mm -hmm. if that doesn't get resolved there are you know classes or the group circle group mm -hmm. groups that are involved friends or witnesses and so on if not that then the school gets involved right. teachers if not then principals and other people get involved yeah. and then if that no, that is also not in, uh, that also doesn't take care of that then the whole community comes together right. Right. and we have a discussion on based on what we have and what we can do and of course it depends on how much we can take right, right. how the community can take some problems we cannot resolve right. and, and we have to take uh, an action which uh, of course we do not want to but uh, that's right. where the limitation rise, lies and uh, in some cases we had to send a child or, or, or an adult even right. or a teacher. Yeah. 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 This yeah. is not the right place uh, so please uh, help yeah. us by going out. And I think that's an important thing to note because um, that part of the reason my first season has been really focused on schools that are well established is because uh, an aspect of what I like to bring to the democratic education community in particular is to emphasize that there is an importance to the social structure that is provided. Is some people think of democratic schools as unstructured and that's in, to me incorrect. They are structured, they're very strongly socially structured. Right because you have to have that protection of the community itself. Yes. No system can survive if it does not have a boundary of what it is. Definitely, definitely, definitely. I think it's a very, very important aspect. If a community is thriving for decades, there are certain boundaries that are set. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, it cannot go beyond those boundaries. Right. Whether in terms of uh, in terms of conflicts or in terms of support, in terms of all that. Mm -hmm. And we also have that uh, system, but that system, of course, may not be clearly, you know, we right. may not be able to clearly define it, yeah. but it is there in right. place right. where yeah. everyone feels that they are protected and they feel secure being in a community, yeah. being yeah. part of it. Otherwise, if a student, if a child feels, oh my God, where to go, what to do, who, who should I approach? Uh, you know, if a child is not able to create that, uh, that uh, support system, mm -hmm. is not able to figure out that support system, child will find it very, very difficult. And that's one of the challenging things for us also. For example, a new child comes mm -hmm. and they are without parents here. Right. Some child may not have parents. Some child comes here and parents they leave so immediately child has to figure out mm -hmm. in some ways that's that itself is a system you see that's that right. itself is a system yeah. child has to figure out okay if I have this problem I have to go to this person or I have to go to this this group mm -hmm. if I have such problem I feel secure here and then a child slowly you know within few weeks child is able to understand the dynamics of the whole community right. and he knows where one has to go when there is a problem if this does not work the child figures out mm -hmm. okay this is where I should go mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and nobody tells him that if this one doesn't work you go there but there is something like that you see yeah, right. this, this is like the, uh, the understanding itself is like that okay child figures that out child is very very children are generally very clever Yes. In that sense, <laughs> they figure out where to go if certain things are not resolved. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
and of course for us it's like um, we are here to serve the children and by serving the children we evolve our consciousness right. so that's the reason why we are always try, we try to be open and open and open mm-hmm. no matter how difficult the situation is right. Right. and to protect the child no matter and also at the same time you know a human being no matter when it's extremely difficult and extremely challenging yes we may not have the capabilities to deal with it and we may have to ask a child to leave but then that's the rarest of the rarest right, right. we believe that every individual has divine in him right. has this potential in him that uh, this this aspect of truth in him and no matter what happens if we can somehow give them the right environment be with them they will eventually flourish mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and we are ready to take that burden the community is built in that such a way that the community itself works so hard to bear that burden at times when it seems to be impossible mm-hmm. it seems to break down but then we hold on to it so that mm-hmm. every child feels that it's their home right right nice so um when so what's the full age range in your community of children um some uh we used i think now at the moment we have a, a small baby she is uh-huh. uh, she's uh two years old i think now uh-huh. two years old and uh, there is we have a grandmother who is 96 years old okay. in the community <laughs> so full age range yeah. <laughs> so um so here what happens is like now uh, students those who grow here and those who decide to live here those who go to university after finishing university mm-hmm. if they want to get married if they fall in love with someone and they decide to be together and stay in the ashram serve the ashram they are free and we have some mm-hmm. couples like that mm-hmm. their children are growing here okay in yeah. the ashram school yeah. so so um so the two year old is that someone whose parents are here parents are here yeah, yes yeah. what's the uh, a mother is here of course father yeah. with no idea where he is Uh, what's the youngest child who doesn't have parents here? <laughs> um now I think at the moment uh, I think 4 years old 4 yeah 4 okay. yeah. right on and and um let's see where was I going with that um so, so You have you you sound sounds like you're very flexible about the age span and when people come and go and what their aspirations are. Um so 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 you have I'm trying to th- trying to put this in <laughs> uh in terms that that makes sense. Um when you look at so the ashram has been like you have kids who've gone on are they they're they're the Your school goes does it go all the way to like the 12th grade or whatever your end of um, regular you know like uh, do do the kids go all the way through 18 in terms of attending school here uh, yes most of the school most, almost all the students they go till the 18 I mean till they finish their schooling yeah uh, some students after 10th grade they opt for uh, skill development They, they focus particularly on skills okay. uh, for example it could be carpentry it could be plumbing it could be bakery it could be uh, uh, it could be um, becoming an electrician or getting a diploma in some other subjects mm-hmm. uh, and, and with they I mean, you have you grow food you make food you have I mean you, the, the ashram is has a lot of uh interesting things going on right. um are they doing that here or do they go somewhere else and learn and then come back or uh, to learn they go out yeah. for example there are colleges there are uh, educational centers where they learn you know bakery mm-hmm. or uh okay. carpentry like becoming an electrician and so on there are some schools which are uh, funded by government or private uh, schools they learn from there and of course we have a huge space and uh, that opportunity for them to experiment right and learn so and also teach the here. the next generation mm, yeah right yeah. now actually we have a pretty much we are equipped with with uh, for example if somebody wants to learn bakery we have a well established bakery and right. bakers they can learn from them right 
we have guests coming from different parts of the world. They engage, they stay here, and uh, they've been like bakers for probably many, many years. They learn from them there. And also, if somebody wants to learn uh, welding, you call it welding, for example, we have a workshop where they can learn all that. And uh, we have some you know, uh, experienced uh, uh, our old students, and they can teach. Similarly, with the hospitality, organic farming, so now the, uh, now the community has developed in such a way that if a student wants to learn, he need not or she need not leave the community and go right. outside for a while. They can, in fact, learn here itself. Right. But at the same time, what happens is if they go outside, they will have a different perspective. They meet different people. That's right. Right. So meeting different people gives them different perspective of life, perspective mm -hmm. of learning and so on. And uh, you know, during the day, few hours they go out, learn, and come back and experiment, and uh, even further their uh, knowledge. Right. So, so they have the opportunity to discover their interest in it here. Yes. And then go deeper elsewhere. It's deeper elsewhere. And then maybe come back or continue to be here yeah. as they're learning that. So generally, what happens uh, is uh, they live here. Ashram sponsors everything, uh, all the financial uh, needs and everything. Their lodging, fooding, all that. Right. They just go for a few hours outside and they come back. And also at the same time what happens is this that provides sustainability to the organization because right. they are helping, they are running uh, you know, different departments, taking responsibility, taking care of the children and so on. Right, right. So they're, they're really contributing when they're here. Yes. And so it's win, it's win, win for everyone. For everyone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. So uh, tell me a story of a time at the, uh, in the school when um, the the community faced a challenge, and then as a result, they are a better school because of it. I mean, our school, yeah, the challenging times. Um, so I have to think about. I have to tell you a challenge that led into the betterment of the school. So, for example, in terms of infrastructure itself, mm -hmm. initially we had a small building mm -hmm. and Ashram did not have enough resources. So we were facing a big challenge uh, in increasing the number of students. Mm -hmm. And people, who, I mean, many parents from you know, across Nepal, they wanted to admit their children. But then when they came, they saw that uh, we did not have that necessary infrastructure to hold the students. Mm -hmm. And many students were, uh, you know, getting admitted, but at the same time they were running away because mm -hmm. they felt that okay, I should go somewhere. They did not feel that uh, uh, they did not want to be here for a long time, mm -hmm. and that led us to think about uh, how we can take care of that. Mm -hmm. Right? We wanted to have students for a long period of time, and that's the idea, you know, in the ashram. If the students are here for at least, I mean. Uh, uh, 10, 12, 13 years, that really gives them the whole perspective of the philosophy, of the ideals, and they become really empowered. And then when they return back to their villages, they can truly change the village, or the, 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 uh, they can contribute to the society rather than fall in the trap of the society where they've come from. Yeah, yeah. So this was a big challenge. Many students, they were living here for five, four, five years, and then again, okay, maybe I should not continue. They were thinking like that and then going out. So fortunately, what this, this led us is that uh, someone came and saw this uh, situation here, that we did not have enough infrastructure, and uh, they proposed that we could actually ask the Indian government to build a, a school building. Mm -hmm. And that's what made us have this building here. Uh, yeah. uh, the Indian Embassy helped us in building that, building yeah. this, this complex, mm -hmm. school complex. The other thing that uh, we, the other very important thing that I just, just came to me is also about the finance. Mm -hmm. So many parents, they used to bring their children or relatives, they, would, they used to bring their children and admit here. And after two, three months or four or five months, when, uh, uh, I mean, they used to come and take the child away from the ashram. Mm -hmm. So this was a big challenge for us because you have certain investments that you make once you 
admit a child, for example, you have to buy books, you have to buy clothes, you have to take care of them, you have to provide space, you have to organize all that. And for example, like uh, even three, four years, taking a child away from the ashram after three, four years is a big burden on us. Mm. Big burden in the sense, not because of finance, but because the child has come at the age of six and he has lived here till the age of nine and then goes back to the village without education mm. and then goes, uh, you know, uh, uh, there and again becomes a drug addict and uh, become, falls into this uh, trap of, you know, of, of uh, social discrimination and all that. So this, it doesn't serve, you see. So what we did is uh, we changed that, okay, if you want to admit a child, you have to deposit a certain amount of money. Mm. Let's say uh, 50,000 rupees. Mm -hmm. Initially, it was just 6,000 rupees and then we increased it. And then what that made is that, okay, if it, once they put certain amount of money, parents or relatives, they started to, the whole thing changed actually. Mm. Now they had to think twice before taking away the child. It's not because we wanted to take, have money from them. Right. It's just that we wanted to make sure that the parents who are really willing to put their child in a proper place or in our place are committed in some ways. So that commitment came yes. by introducing, you see, a certain amount of commitment, of financial commitment from the parents. And one time payment, you know, right. one time, uh, what do you say? It's like... Uh, like an addition to the bill. Yes. So one time deposit would, um, and that changed the whole thing. And mm -hmm. uh, we generally, when we uh, uh, talk to parents or relatives about admitting a child, what, hap what we do is we want the child to at least finish schooling mm -hmm. in the ashram. Or at least after their, after their, their 10th grade, they at least complete some kind of skill or they, they they develop that and mm -hmm. finish and then they have they can take or they want whatever they want to do because they are mature enough in some ways to take decision mm -hmm. and uh, and that they don't fall into you know what the society demands of them or what their parents demand of them mm -hmm. they're they have they're equipped to live freely yes some kind of freedom is there at least because you know uh, when there is no financial freedom, when there is no capability, skills, and so on, you have to fall into, uh, you know, sometimes you have to do horrible things that you don't want to do. Right. Right. And uh, in that aspect, uh, you know, that introducing a certain rule, of course, mm -hmm. these rules are not always applicable, for example, for a child who does not have parents or relatives at all. Right. Right. So nothing is asked from them. But right. if they have parents, they have to show minimum amount of commitment through right. either by staying here, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. one of the parents should stay here, uh -huh. or they have to deposit certain amount of mm, yeah. certain amount. Yeah. So that way, you know, child stays here and uh, grows here and lives here for a longer period of time. Mm -hmm. And that accomplishes in some ways, helps us to accomplish the mission of the ashram. Yeah. And child also builds that ability, capability to bear the challenge of the society. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and that's actually a theme that I've seen in some other ones as well, is that uh, um, it is a challenge to ensure that you're not just some experiment. Right. That, that you're, you're committed and you want people who are committing, children who are committed, parents who are committed, if, if, if parents are available, you know, that that, that is something that's it, it challenge everywhere. Uh, yeah, uh, in some ways you can say that we are committed to some kind of result, mm -hmm. some kind of result. It's not like you have to be like this, right. but we don't want children uh, growing out of the ashram to fall into this, you know, uh, uh, the, I mean, fall into this, uh, uh, the, the, the pressure or the, 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 uh, what do you say, the, fall into the, what the society puts on them or the families puts on them, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So to take care of that, uh, we need to give them some tools. We need to make sure that they have those tools to take care of their 
basic needs right. once they come out of the organization because because of poverty people may have to do horrible things and we don't want that from right. we don't want to uh, uh, we don't want our children to fall into that right. situation you're, you're committed to a liberatory liberation right rather than simply passing time or, or right. you know right. that, that's very very we are very strict yeah this is one of the most strictest rules that we um, uh, that we are very much uh, straightforward with the parents or the relatives right. Right. you cannot take your, if you want to admit a child you cannot take your child before they finish their education mm -hmm. before they finish their 18th or 20th year in right. the ashram right. right. and after that right <laughs> yes yeah yeah and i think that's that's really important to, to acknowledge the context in which that's true yes um, yeah that, that this is nepal this uh, is nepal and we are working especially with us uh, with students of you know those who really need that support economic that's right. that's social right. support that's right. that's right so so this is um a, a special school in that sense and is, is that its mission and it serves a certain segment of the population, segment of Nepali society. Um, it's not uh, kids from the rich classes coming in and trying it out. <laughs> you know, it's not that at all. That's not um, that. and, and, so, and so that's, I think, an important context to note, yeah. because I think when people hear, some of the people in the West are going to hear some of what you just said and cringe. Uh, yeah. <laughs> because because they're, they're thinking from their context that's very different. Right, right, right. Um, and so I think I think, but I think you've communicated very clearly um, yeah. is that we set it up and, and the, the commitment is there for a reason and for the liberation. Uh, it's not it, it, that's what's really first is yeah. the liberatory educative process. Yes, um, not merely getting some diploma. It's not it's it, that's that's trivial. Yeah, some people might think, oh, they want to keep it for a long period of time to give certain kind of, you know, to uh, what do you say? Some may even think that uh, we are trying to brainwash, brainwash them <laughs> right. by keeping them for a long. Here, you see, there are no boundaries. Right. There are no boundaries. You've been here. You've seen here. Children are, you know, Children are uh, communicating with people from different parts of the world. Okay. They are playing with them. They are learning different languages. Mm -hmm. They are experimenting on entrepreneurship. They are going out to the market selling things for the community. Mm -hmm. And uh, they are just having interaction, you know, left, right uh, uh, and center, you know, right. with everybody. Right. Exactly. So the, the, there is no one idea that we are perpetuating. The idea, of course, there is this great, uh, the, 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 overall encompassing philosophy of Mother and Sri Aurobindo, right. but there is no one religion that we follow, there is no one particular, uh, uh, you know, uh, theory that we follow. Right. Uh, we believe that everybody has that innate possibility, innate uh, nature, and one has to discover that. That's right. the only right. thing. <laughs> and whatever aids into that process, we tell we provide it. We right. try to bring it, right? So we have uh, volunteers from different parts of the world with different ideas, different ideologies, different religion, different race, different uh, languages, and they are constantly communicating with our students. So there is no way that we are trying to, you know, <laughs> brainwash them and create right. some kind of... <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. Um, but I, I wanted to bring that up because, because I mean, from the psychological perspective, um, the, the democratic nature is actually the exact counter of what you would consider uh, what psychologists call a total situation. So there's the fear of immersing in a long term and things like that. Mm -hmm. But but what you've described from the very beginning and what I've seen here is that it is open. It yeah. is an open system. It is uh, that the children are uh, freely interacting. Uh, you know, they really are. It is an immersion, but it's a voluntary immersion. All right. It is that you've created such a welcoming place where those children feel that they belong. Mm -hmm. Is that they develop an identity, and it, it's informed yeah. by the ashram, yeah. but it is not determined. It is not controlled. It is not the, the, those things that would be define the exact opposite. That the brainwashing type thing, that the cult thing, mm -hmm. um, is about control and overwhelming them and and uh, you know sleep deprivation and 
you know, those all those other things. That does not have any. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> So, Our children as as free as anybody in the world, sure. you know. In fact, I want to tell I, I'm going to tell you a little story problem. because um, uh, just yesterday you had someone who's considering volunteering here. Uh, she arrived from France, um, and she was uh, coming. She's a teacher in France, but she's a main, you know, very much a mainstream school. And so when she showed up within one day, so I we met her in the morning because she was. Uh, come arriving as we were leaving in the same vehicle <laughs> and and we said hi and then we met her at dinner and she was amazed she was amazed that the children were free they didn't they didn't take direction they didn't need direction uh, we we talked uh, for a while because it was really interesting because here's somebody from the mainstream and they within one day she understood that these kids were really operating in a fundamentally different way because they they were free. You're right. And they knew what to do and when to, you know, they, they knew things. Yeah, yeah. And she was challenged because she's not sure she's needed here. <laughs> yeah. Because she's thinking in traditional teaching terms. Sure. Oh, I will go there and what kind of responsibility, what I'm going to do, how am I going to play the role in, that doesn't happen here, you see. Exactly. Kids know what they are supposed to do, and you have to also discover what you are supposed to do or what right. your role, you see. That's right. So it's not like, okay, there is a vacancy here, and then we put somebody. Right. It's about figuring out your own place. Everybody will find their place eventually in the ashram now. And if there is someone missing, it's not like everything is going to collapse at the right, same time. Right, right, right. right. And uh, that's the thing. Yeah. And that's the one thing I observed. Um, when I was working, I spent a year teaching psychology at the Village Free School, and and I was watching kind of, and because I'd volunteered there at various times, I've seen many staff people come, kind of intern comes in, they spend six months there, and, and a lot of their time is trying to figure out what do I have to offer here, mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> and, and so I think it's actually a common theme in democratic schools is that uh, you you come in and you do have in, in a way democratic schools are structured for the adults in a challenging way because you have to figure out who are you and what do you have to offer here. Uh, yeah. You know, it's not you're an expert and you get to do this. No. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know. Now now it's not that that doesn't exist because like I said, yes. I came in, I offered psychology, and and I got to teach it for a year. Mm -hmm. But that was because the kids asked for it, and I happened to be available to offer it. Right, right. And so that was, and that was after, you know, being in that community for a long time in volunteering in other ways. Um, and then, oh, here's this opportunity to share something I happen to be an expert in. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so it's really important. I, I think, you know, I, I think that the, the democratic approach is, is structurally about a spiritual path, mm -hmm. even if you don't call it that. Here right. you do. Here we do. Here we do. Whether you name it or not, I think there is a fundamental difference because, I mean, I have come across, I mean, some volunteers here and uh, they come here and find it very, I mean, confused in some ways. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what, what should I do? Or, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, some, nobody is interested or some, some, I mean, I don't find my place here and so on. And uh, in few days, they find out that there is always a space for everybody. <laughs> it's just that you have to open yourself in some ways, right? right. You have to be willing to listen to or willing to see through many things, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And sometimes you may end up working with only one student. Mm -hmm. But if you are expecting that everybody is going to, all there will be a system that will be created and then uh, you will be slotted in a particular place, particular time period, particular time frame, particular curriculum, particular subject matter, particular questions, particular answers, and particular questions that are going to come to the uh, exams, and finally delivering that through result and so on. It doesn't happen here. Right. right. right? <laughs> it's about how much, it's like you have to, in some ways it's an experiment on yourself as well, and you may have to, you may have, you, you need to have that plasticity within you mm -hmm. as a volunteer to adapt yeah. to the situation of a, 
a democratic school right in a democratic school you might you may you may not immediately find what you uh, can do but if you are open enough if you are plastic enough you will find out eventually like right. something beautiful that you can offer mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. wonderful actually let's call it there yeah uh, thank, <laughs> thank you, you so much, much. Um, I really appreciate it and uh, oh in before we finish up completely uh, tell our audience uh, where can they find out more information so if you want to know more about uh, our organization you can visit our webpage www.auronepal.org and uh, a u r o n e p a l dot o r g that's our organization website and you can write an email to me that's uh, uh, a u r o v e d a auroveda at gmail.com if you want to know more about the school more about our philosophy more about what we do and the activities that we run for our students and globally also because we run various different uh, programs like yoga meditation uh, what is integral education philosophy all that right. can be found out and you can also subscribe to our uh, uh, sub stack also we have a sub stack newsletter as well that right. we have recently introduced so yeah everybody is invited to come and join us here yeah. like don has come and uh, <laughs> hopefully he has liked it Yes, very much. And I, I also want to put in a plug for uh, Aro Nepal's, uh, your travel services. Is yes. That, uh, that we have been lovely, uh, had lovely guides, and we have been well supported in our travels with, with the whole crew. That, that, that yes, yes, our students, ex-students, now they're adults, they're supporting the organization by running uh, Travel and Trek as well. Yeah. Uh, that's where our students explore entrepreneurship and all that, tourism and all that. So if you are planning to come to Nepal, you can, you know, just let us know, write an email and yeah. uh, we'll organize your travel here. Exactly. That is we have a beautiful hotel where you can stay, hostels. Uh, so th this is a community uh, for a lifetime, you know. Uh, yes. It's a family and once you are connected, it's always there for you. Yes. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tom.